hero's welcome for two NASA astronauts who have finally returned home after spending nine months stranded in space. And splashdown, Crew 9 back on Earth. SUNY Williams and Butch Wilmore, along with two other Crew 9 members, splashed down off the coast of Tallahassee, Florida, just before 6 a.m. Singapore, Hong Kong time. The journey back to Earth took 17 hours from the time the SpaceX Dragon Freedom spacecraft undocked from the International Space Station. This was the moment when Miss Williams exited the capsule followed shortly by Mr. Wilmore. It's the first breath of fresh air for the pair since they departed for the ISS last year. So just how did they end up getting stuck in space? But Wilmore and Williams blasted off in the Boeing Starliner last June, heading to the International Space Station. They were supposed to be back in just over a week, but things didn't go as planned. During their 24-hour journey to the ISS, five of the spacecraft's 28 thrusters malfunctioned. A propellant valve also failed, and multiple helium leaks were reported. NASA eventually deemed the vehicle unsafe for crew, and the capsule returned to Earth in September last year without the two astronauts. Now, the current plan to bring the stranded space flyers home was then set into motion. A SpaceX mission called Crew-9 was launched that same month. It brought two astronauts to the ISS on board a Dragon spacecraft with two empty seats for Wilmore and Williams. But the long-awaited Crew-10 mission to swap out the astronauts was delayed in its final hour last week due to a hydraulic issue. It blasted off two days later, paving the way for Wilmore and Williams to return home. So what were the astronauts up to during their extended stay? Between them, they spent more than 900 hours working on more than 150 scientific experiments. Asuni Williams also broke the record for the most spacewalk time by a woman, a staggering 62 hours and 6 minutes across all her missions. The NASA assures that despite the delay, their time in space posed no major risks, with the ISS resupplied with all the essentials like food, water, and oxygen. But NASA also flags potential risks to personal health of astronauts due to extended stay in space, from vision changes to bone density loss. And it says the radiation in space could potentially increase the risk of cancer and other degenerative disorders, though research into this is still ongoing. So with all these risks, why do we keep sending astronauts into space? Now, the answer lies in the unique environment of space. Microgravity offers scientists a chance to conduct groundbreaking research from how molecules react in space and how the human body adapts to spaceflight. An observation from orbit also provides a key source of data to track climate change and inform natural disaster responses. All right, joining us now is Quentin Parker, professor at Laboratory for Space Research at University of Hong Kong. Professor, I mean, an incredible story we're following today. Just how unusual is it for astronauts to be stranded in space for such an extended period of time? And how remarkable is it that they were able to return to Earth the way they did? Well, it's not unheard of. It is very rare. I mean, there was, uh, I think it was uh, NASA astronaut uh, Frank Rubio ended up spending an extra six months on board the International Space Station back in 2022. And he was meant to be up there for six months. He had to extend it to about a year. And that was, again, because there was a coolant leak in, 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 the, uh, in the system that was bringing him home. So it made a normal return mission impossible. But he eventually did return on, on a Soyuz, I think, M23 rocket uh, capsule on, on in September 2023. So that was another precedent. So it's not the only time that uh, astronauts have been stranded in space, uh, but it is very rare. So what's your assessment on how well NASA and SpaceX handled the, the unexpected challenges related to the astronauts' extended stay on the ISS? Were they flexible and rapid enough? Um, well, it depends who you listen to. I mean, uh, Elon Musk has been commenting on this 
and saying that they, he could have brought them home sooner. But nevertheless, if you listen to NASA, everything's gone according to plan, and they've come back on, on, a, on a wonderful Dragon capsule, uh, as you see. It looks very... When you look inside a capsule, you saw the astronauts coming out. They look like they're inside a sort of a, a Zen spacecraft. They look like they're wearing Formula One uh, spacesuits, <laughs> etc. <laughs> it's very clean and very, very modern and swish. Um, but yes, uh, that came back flawlessly, and so that was great. It's only because the Starliner Boeing capsule uh, didn't function uh, completely as intended. Now, don't forget, it did come back to Earth safely in the end. Uh, it was just uh, they were just uh, risk averse and deciding not to, not to risk because it wasn't risk free if they went back when they could have done uh, with that uh, spacecraft. So it is an issue for NASA that uh, at the moment uh, is only the Dragon X which is shown to be reliable uh, and, and the mechanism, you know, the vehicle with which uh, astronauts are, are taken to and from the International Space Station from the American side. Professor, thankfully, the astronauts' trip back was successful without any obvious hiccups that we could see from our vantage. Can you talk to us about the science behind Splashdown? How textbook was today's return? It looked completely textbook. I mean, America, NASA have been doing splashdowns uh, for decades, and it went. Uh, you saw the uh, parachutes deploy. You, you saw it wasn't a, a crash landing in any sense into the water, uh, and so uh, that, that's the way the Americans have been doing it uh, for decades. And if you look at the the Russians and the Chinese, they they touch down on land. Uh, you know, in, in the Gobi Desert in, in, in the case of China. So these are very different ways of doing it. I mean, you look at those beautiful uh, canopies deploying and then detaching as the as the capsule entered and then floated. Uh, and then you see the ships arriving and then rescuing the astronauts, as has been done many, many times. OK, so away from home, these two astronauts were away from home unexpectedly for nine months. Surely to me, one of the first things they probably want to do is see their families. Will they be able to do that? Uh, what is the protocol for returning astronauts who have been away for so long? Well, I mean, they get tested out completely. They do all these health checks and things like that. And, and now the turnaround time is, is, is quicker than it used to be. There's, you know, I think a total of 700 astronauts have been up in space over the decades, uh, no more than that. So, uh, in fact, the data on the health side of things is very interesting because you've only got a, a relatively small sample. You know, when you do medical studies, you have tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of uh, patients in the records from which you can make uh, deductions and assessments. But in the case of astronauts, you've only got relatively few. Most are up there for short periods of time. Those that are up there for long periods of time, like these astronauts, uh, you know, for nine months, it's actually not very often. Uh, we do know uh, the environment up in space in the microgravity. Uh, we do know what some of the effects are, like bone loss, like you mentioned, like vision problems uh, and all sorts of things. And also radiation, it's enhanced radiation. We don't have the Earth's atmosphere to protect the astronauts. You've got the spacecraft itself and the space station, which does absorb some of the ionizing radiation, but some gets through. And so you're exposed to high levels of ionizing radiation when you're in space. And so all these things have been studied in detail, as I said, over decades from, from early before Apollo and right through to, to today. But the, the amount of data is actually relatively limited, and especially for those who are in space for months and on end. But so uh, there... it's seeing what the data seems to oh, sorry. So please go ahead, Professor. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say what it seems to show is that if you're up there for five months, the body seems to take another five months to kind of get back to the way it was before in terms of recovering, uh, you know, your bone mass and recovering your, your, your function of your muscles and everything. But it does seem to be some evidence that there's a long term loss of one to two percent of, of your capacity after a long stay in space. OK, uh, so, Professor, how do failures or delays like this in a spacecraft program affect the broader space exploration ecosystem in terms of future mission planning and you know, spacecraft development or even international partnership? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, the people, obviously, I mean, this is scientific. I mean, a full investigation will occur. They'll look into all the details of what happened. And, you know, the Starliner, the Starliner spacecraft itself from, from Boeing has a big question mark over it now. If you go and try to find out what the plans are for the future of Starliner, but going to the website, you can't find anything out. You know, you can't find anything of what they're planning. So I think there's a, perhaps a, a question mark over it now, which means that the backup system that the America had in place to take astronauts to space, not just SpaceX, but Boeing. I mean, Matt, you might only now be down to SpaceX. The key thing here is that it's not NASA now. These are Boeing's a private company. You know, Elon Musk, uh, SpaceX, that's a private company. 
So now national missions are in the hands of private companies. And you have to ask yourself, well, is this actually a really good thing? I mean, it may be a very good thing. It's certainly probably very cost effective, saves a lot of money. But is it necessarily uh, the only way we should be moving forward with these things? And that's for the politicians and others to decide. Uh, but in terms of uh, safety, I think you can see that the Dragon spacecraft looks uh, excellent. It's performing nominally and very well. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a problem with Starliner. I mean, it still, in, in the end, got back to Earth safely, despite the problems that it had. But they just didn't want to risk putting those two astronauts on board. And so they had to stay up uh, for a lot longer than eight days. Uh, before we go, so how professor... it affects things in the future. Yeah. Go ahead. Say again. No, uh, please repeat. Uh, before we go, we're running out of time here. Uh, apologies. But I want your thoughts on what Barry Wilmore has said uh, in the past. He said that this saga has been affected by politics. So I'm curious, from your perspective, was there political interference possibly in delaying the pair's return from the ISS? I couldn't possibly comment on that. Okay. I don't know. Thank you very I mean, much. Uh, it depends. You know, it's out there on the internet, you anybody is free to able to to read and look at it, and you can see the comments from uh, you know the the CEO Elon Musk himself. So that's not a secret. It's out there in the media. People can just check that out for themselves if they want to. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Appreciate your time today, Professor Quentin Parker, Director of Lab for Space much. Research from the University of Hong Kong.